Welcome, ladies and gentlemen, for our program. I'm Armando Ev Sanchez. We're doing a series of shows, uh, Fourth Industrial Revolution on our doorstep. What is the impact of the idea, especially brought up in one of these great number one bestsellers, Martin Ford, Rise of the Robots? We, a core of individuals uh, from different backgrounds, uh, education, engineering, printing, CEOs, uh, community members, have been dialoguing about this topic. And, you know, we've brought together some of those leaders, of which we're going to have a panel today and have the discussion about the topic. Um, we watched a short clip also on YouTube. Uh, on Martin Ford, recommend everybody watch it. He's talking about information, his three main ideas that come out of his book. And first of all, I want to thank Felix Zuniga. Uh, Felix is in San Bernardino. He's a candidate for a PhD, and uh, we look forward and applaud his efforts and work to get there. Um, it's going to be a great party, so get hop, hop, <laughs> hop to it, please. Yes. <laughs> You're getting older. Let's get to yeah. it, you know. Uh, so we'll call you PhD pretty soon. So uh, thank you, Felix Zuniga. And also a great friend of mine who's been a mentor to me, who's, uh, you know, I call him sometimes and I say, Manuel, I, I, I don't get this. And Manuel sits there patiently listening to us. Manuel Franco, he is at Monarch Litho, but he's also a leader in the community, very well respected, works with uh, Bosco Tech in San Gabriel, California, um, in the technology world. So. We've been all dialoguing together. We brought together the show. So, and hopefully we can get uh, Mr. Dale Hahn on the program as well. He is S3 production CEO. Wow, where do we start? Well, let me, let, let, let me start with this. Um, the topic, this is a New York bestseller, uh, Rise of the, Ro of the Robots, Technology and the Threat of a Jobless Future. And this is sort of called economics, business, futurism, it's called different things, but this is out of Silicon Valley. And they're talking basically that, as I understand it in an oversimplified format, that there is a need for a deep concern that um, mechanization, digitalization, technology, AIs, et cetera, uh, are having an impact on employment. So let me stop there. Let's bring in our panelists. Let me start first of all with Manuel Franco, his perspective on it, and then we're going to go to Felix Zuniga, and then we'll start the discussion between ourselves. Well, as I've seen it in the experience that I've come through and in the print industry, which is a, an industry that actually changed the world, communications. Mm -hmm. Movable type brought to the masses information in print, and from there it continued. And to this point, it still continues giving content, information content to the world. But then the computers have come on and taken over that side of it, and communication is starting to change. So now we hear the fact that, that print is dying. Well, I would challenge that. But still, what we've seen in print is a tremendous change in the amount of people that we need to complete the tasks that were before done. It used to take a team of 20 people to turn around and complete a printed project. Now we can get it done with a handful, three, four, five people, because it's all automated. We've got the computer to do a tremendous amount of parts. We've got automated equipment, and we've got companies that have a handful of people doing billions of dollars of work a year with much less people that we had before. So we see the impact that's going in our industry, and it's covering a lot of other industries, as even into the medical field, <clears throat> to the legal field, and I, you start to see the fact that now they're putting, because of the AI capabilities of computers, you ask the, com the computer a legal question, and it'll come back with a number of uh, briefs as to what can be done with that. That's going to impact everything. So it's a concern of what we need to do in the future. 
And the focus that I take is, you know, how do we prepare our youth to make sure that they're going to have the mentality and the capabilities and the information to be able to handle this and change the world the way it needs to be for a benefit to humanity. Thank you, Manuel. Thank you. Felix? <clears throat> so first of all, Armando, thank you once again for having me on your show. Um, I think it's vital that we're having these conversations and that we're bringing these topics to the forefront, um, especially as it impacts you know, our communities. Um, you know, being in the education industry, I work at a higher ed public four year institution, as well as the technology sector within, within there, I get to see where these two worlds collide. And, uh, you know, my love of working with students keeps me in the forefront of, of guiding and help preparing them for, you know, this future that's coming after they learn how to navigate, you know, the hoops of a university, right? And, and what that means to get higher education. Um, the threat, if you want to call it that, is real. Um, and, I, and I say threat because it's, it's something that's ongoing in our everyday work life. Uh, you know, find better ways to get the job done via technology. You know, if it's a, if it's a repetitive job, you know, there has to be some way that we can do that better. The reality of, of the lack of support for public education and public funded education is real and the cutbacks are there. You know, so we're, we're told daily to do more with less and to solve the challenges that we have and we're facing now with the technology that's available to us. And if we don't have it, learn about how to do it because the, the reality is we're not gonna be getting more money to solve these challenges. And we're already overloaded as it is with the amount of students that want and need access to education. So, so like I say, the threat is real because I hear it every day. You know, today we talked about um, the evaluator process at a university who looks at what a student needs to be able to say that they're complete. And, you know, when one of our teams went into an office, they saw stacks of paper where they had to print out individual reports to go evaluate whether or not the student was eligible to graduate. So the team was able to create a process that merged multiple systems did the analysis for them and then presented a list of, hey, here are your students, right? So what took weeks of work is able to be done in, in minutes, but it's now an everyday part of their job. <clears throat> We're still at a point where there's not a lack of work for those people, so it's not an issue. You know, it's not a jobless tomorrow for them right now, um, but it, it is the reality of how can we do more with less and how can we use tech to solve that gap? Likewise, evolve into a, a an organization that is meeting our consumers, right? The students who are consumers of education where they are, not where where we are, where we come from. So it's this constant balance and, and struggle that we go through on a daily basis. You know, we each of us sees the world or sees the topic through our filters of our environment where we're at. Lens, lenses, if you will. <laughs> Mine, you know, uh, I just finished going through, finishing traveling through all the seven continents, and I'm drawn back to <clears throat> India and Africa, where people are high-ended, people are earning $2 a day. So, you know, and then obviously the China market. I was there three years ago. So not only... So we have people around the world growing in population size that are willing to take on a job and do it for pennies to the dollar. And then on top of that, you had another layer of technology where, you know, they're probably doing it in a fraction of a penny in an extraordinary amount of time. So we have these potentials of taking jobs and diminishing them diminishing any kind of major job and I think Manuel highlighted the software now in the legal profession what but I don't but I don't see a lot of articles of alarm or telling people you know we have a problem with unemployment or we're headed toward a position where we're gonna have a lot of people walking around with no opportunities why is that 
why, why don't we hear it? I don't have the answer. I'm just sort of posing it and you know starting the discussion from there. You know, at, at the university not so long ago, excuse me, when, um, we had a a talk on on 1984, right? The the book uh, and are we there, right? And and we brought some faculty members from different colleges to to offer their perspectives from a sociological, a historical, and a political um, sense. And you know, they they just talked about how. The, the society that we've created has, has put the blinders up, you know, and, and everyone's walking with their, their face and their phone and their device and, and they become numb or immune to the world, to society around them. And, you know, the question is, was, are, are we there? Are we there yet? Right. From the 1984 book. And, you know, a lot of people in the room came to the conclusion that, that yeah, you know, that our, our, our We've created this life where we don't look past what's going on in front of us or we're connected to this digital world that may not be physically in front of us, but, you know, you can be in the world of Facebook or Twitter and be engaged in a conversation that's happening around the world. And it's, it's amazing, but yet at the same time, you're not seeing what's in front of you. And I think that's what's happening at a, at a bigger level where we're not talking about it as a society because we're, we're worried about what's going on with the Kardashians or what was the latest tweet that Trump sent out. You know, and and that becomes the focus and talk, and the the threat of you know nuclear war tomorrow, and not necessarily the jobs that are are going away. You know, because it's it's just hyper sensationalized and it's so immediate and it's you know we don't wait till tomorrow's newspaper to find out what happened in the world. It's it's immediate now, you know, and and that can become very distracting. I think. But then again, you've got the area that. You've got media or the news coming out that you know, unemployment is at its lowest point, right? Correct. 3.94 something. Uh, so what is the reality? Are we really at unemployment? Or is that just fake news is what keeps on coming out, right? Yeah. So those are the areas that we've got. And then the changes, uh, again, the automated changes that are coming through even though they're in front of us, nobody's paying attention because of the same things. You're being told not to worry about it because everybody's working. But yet the homeless, you know, one of, one of the points that, that they came out in that um, YouTube thing uh, that, that we were looking at is the fact that the numbers are showing some radical differences that, that just, you know, we're making more money but we need less people to, to, to make the money with, right? Mm -hmm. And then that last graph that, that came out that showed the fact that there's not going to be any jobs left, yet we're going to be making so much money that the rich are going to be super rich and the rest of us are going to be wondering what we're going to do with our lives. And so the question is that, you know, it is... Something that's going to have to happen, evolution. We're going to have to improve through automation, technology. But it is, what are we going to do with our lives and humanity to keep them busy, to keep them em employed? And, and by that, I mean, one of the main reasons that we have work is to keep ourselves busy and occupied. Manuel, you just reminded me of the famous story of Moses. Yeah, uh, uh, Catholic school education. I think it triggered it in there. Um, you know, I remember the story of all this terrific, terrible things that they had to do to finally um, be released by Pharaoh to go out into the desert, going in circles for 40 years. Right. Obviously, no GPS. And then when they got to the promised land, Moses couldn't cross over. Okay, fine. So we know that's classic story. But the question remains, what the heck happened to 40 years? Yes. You know, being out in the desert was not, you know, they don't talk about what, you know, the trials and tribulations of living out in the sand. And obviously if food was not a problem. It would fall out of the sky every day. And then you have to eat the same thing for 40 years. That was another problem, putting that aside. So we're talking about, you know, a lot of this book, like here, he says, you know, and, and other people in the technology world says, we see a better future. We have hope. You know, everybody's off. Everybody's in leisure. Everybody, you know, uh, computers took away all the drudgery. I get all that. <clears throat> what happens in between now and then? 
what happens to all the people that are being displaced over the next, according to them, next two decades, as we're letting people go and no one seems to be addressing it? I mean, where are we going with all this? Exactly. What do we do? In addition to that, you know, I would I would throw out there if if the current, you know, the way society behaves towards, you know, people who are jobless or homeless is any indication of what we're going to in the future, it's very scary for me, you know, because uh, I see people are, are like discarded, you know, and and person will fall on, on the sidewalk and people will step over them before they, they give them help, you know, and that's, I think we need to return to the humanity of it because when when it all comes down to it, if that's the future, you know, we're not headed in the right direction, in my opinion. And those are the areas that we have to, to, to really start to bring up. And, and that's part of the things that I'm, I'm trying to work on to make sure that as we teach technology, the information that they need to, to move forward and gain new jobs, if you want to call it, we also have to teach them humanity and what it really means to be a human being. Mm -hmm. And not it just in the aspect of technology, but in the aspect of, you know, you know, taking care of your, your brother. And, and these are areas that are very difficult and uh, uh, still being challenged as, you know, Armando was saying back in the days of Moses, it hasn't changed much. We're still in that, but it's gonna get worse because at one point, based on what we're seeing is that the robots are gonna start to be thinking for us. And they're going to start to make a lot of the decisions. And what are we going to be doing? And Armando, back to your original question, you know, I, I think that concept of the robots, maybe it's been too sensationalized by, by television or movies. And, and, you know, people see it as this way too distant future. But, but you know, we've, we've talked about this before. It, it's here. You know, the, the automation that's happening in transportation and warehousing and, and production, you know, it, it's happening now. Uh, it's even happening in in surgery, right? I saw a video where where robots are performing cardio, you know, thoracic surgery, and uh, it's it's amazing when we're able to utilize the technology. But no one sees it coming, I guess, until it comes for them, right? Uh, uh, and maybe right. that's maybe that's what's happening out there. I, I agree with that perspective. That it's uh, it, it, all these horrible things may happen, but it won't happen to me. Correct. But then, then, you know, you, when you were saying having the computer in front of you or the, the, the phone and everything else, virtual, virtual reality is coming out so strong also yeah. that it's just putting to, you know, faking what really is happening in front of you. Correct. Run that one by me again. Virtual reality. Okay. Okay. All these units that you can put on uh, headsets, you can put on, and then all of a sudden change your world. You know, we take a look at uh, Star Trek and uh, the, the, the ships that have these places that you go in and then you flip a button and you're into a different world. That's, you're in the holodeck or something. Right, the holodeck is what I'm talking about. Okay, that's virtual reality, right? We've got it now. And, and then we're, we're, we're letting ourselves go into that and then changing our minds of to what re, what reality is. So I don't know how that's going to affect and that's just something that, you know, as we were talking, hit me. So are you proposing the idea that virtual reality was created to sort of appease the people that don't have anything else to do? Exactly. Hmm. Yesterday, yesterday, um, Supreme Court said that uh, uh, sports betting cannot be controlled. It, it, it's open-ended. So theoretically, the way I read that is that now people can spend their whole days sports betting. Uh, call you back. Okay. All right. sports, sports betting sports. things uh, you know, around anyway. the world. You know, <laughs> uh, you know, I can spend all day doing soccer games in Europe and ping pong games in China and then back in the morning back to the U.S. and spend my whole life just betting on the TV. I better win because if I'm losing all the time, I'm the history. So is that what you're saying, Manuel? Something into that effect. I mean, you know, you keep on hearing in stories from back when 
the Romans were going through a transition period and the reasons why they built the Colosseums was to keep Oh, busy. God. Yeah. Right? I hadn't thought of that. Occupied. Yeah. I, I mean, I haven't personally watched pro sports in a long time because I think it's, it's just another distractor. You know, I, I, I dislike it. Uh, a billion dollar could be a trillion dollar distraction. Yeah. Yeah. So we're, we're, we're bringing on distractions to what the reality is. And how do we handle that? What do we do? How do we prepare our youth to start to manage it? You know, you talk about the universities and, and, and the universities almost seemed like they're going to start to disappear as you mentioned yeah because once they get once they get virtual reality down you know to where a student can sit at home but feel like they're a part of a, a class and and that augmented reality can be real for them the, the cost of the university infrastructure is going to not make sense you know i mean we're already there with uh what's called a mooc right a massive online open course yeah. you can classes through MIT, Harvard, online for free. You know, Amanda, you can go take a computer science class at Harvard, you know, uh, computer science 101, and, and it's done really, really well. You know, um, so as that gets better, and as, you know, those organizations are able to produce content at a, at a level that's higher than what they can even get in the classroom, because, you know, let's face it, not every teacher or faculty member is, is meant to to perform, right? Uh, they're, they're not always able to capture the full attention of a student. So if you're able to get that skill and knowledge and ability to be able to, to produce content that's learnable in a, in, a, in a way that attracts the student, you know, it's definitely gonna change the way that service is delivered. And, and you know, like you said, that organization is gonna disappear eventually, I think. You know, I was, I, I, I was laughing a little bit when Felix was talking. I can imagine a, a teacher in front of a camera learning how to juggle so he can keep the attention of the students, you know, <laughs> virtually anywhere in the world. It's, oh, you guys are, you know, let me do a few card tricks for a few seconds to keep your attention so we come back yeah. to the topic of quantum physics. Yeah. Is that what you used to do? <laughs> <laughs> I was in a classroom of three. I couldn't have, I couldn't hide anywhere. <laughs> so, so Felix, uh, but okay, your campus already has one professor, and I think you're the one who took me in there, somebody did, where there is one math professor, and he's teaching in three campuses down the state of California. Coachella Valley and Calexico, I think he was teaching, and I got to see the program. This was years ago. Yeah, no, so we they were doing distance learning, you know, and and you know, there, there's it, it's not quite there yet, right? It's not seamless there because there's still audio visual connections. People aren't necessarily trained, but it's getting better, right? Where we're at now is is way better than what we used to be. Let me ask you a question. Something you highlighted. You said that uh, virtual reality for teaching or mm -hmm. for attending the class is not that good. Give me a, take a shot in the dark. How long would it take for it to get well? To no, be, I, the I system is a, be a good system. Three to five years. I mean, it, Ouch. It, it's, it's really, it's really close. I mean, you know, as, as, I mean, you'll, Google was pushing Google Glass, you know, and, and all the different tech companies were coming out with their, their versions, but you know, it's just their, 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 they're pilot things and they're learning from it and what worked and what didn't work. And they're taking that back and they have teams of people that are just working on, on this stuff solely, you know? And so um, we, we have departments in our, our university and our, and our, we have a dedicated team towards, you know, immersive technology and innovation and in, in academic technology. And that's what they do is they, they work with faculty members to say, okay, um, you teach biology, you know, how can we use virtual reality to do that? So one of our classes uses, um, a simulation that has a virtual world to teach archaeology archaeology so they don't have to go outside to the world to learn about what it means to excavate to, to dig to to go and, and learn about these places in the world that they might not be able to travel to because of money but they can explore and understand what these things mean and, and for 
anthropology, you know, there's a whole uh, area of that. And, and like I said, what's coming with bio and nursing, nursing is doing tons of things with, with virtual reality right now. Um, just being able to visually see the human body in front of you and, and pull apart our, our different systems and how they interact and, and physically manipulate them or virtually manip manipulate them in front of you. But it, it adds a whole new dimension of learning rather than just reading from a book. It was interesting to, to, to note on, uh, I was watching a report on acceptance to universities and one young man uh, was able to, in his high school age, able to pass a number of university courses. And they asked him, how did you get that information? He says, on YouTube. Mm -hmm. Yep. He was able to pass and have the information to get through all these universities. And then you turn around and, who is it, MIT. They have a tremendous investment in a department that researches the future in mm -hmm. everything that they can do. And who runs it? A guy that doesn't even have a degree. Mm -hmm. Okay? They, they just hired him and the man, you know, did not go to, to, to university to, to gain that knowledge. So it's, um, you know, it's changing the way that we learn. And that's a lot that we have to go through. The apprenticeship model, okay, that's gone. Yet, at certain points, it's needed. Mm -hmm. Because the way we learn is through, I keep on saying is through example. Okay, and the examples that we get by those that are around us, and it normally is the older people. So it's, you know, what are we doing? How are we changing? How are we doing? Sorry, guys. <laughs> yeah, sorry. Yeah, I'm in a conference, okay? I'll let me, let me, let me, I, let me say that I think, I, I think we're, Okay, let me see if I understand this correctly, because this is a lot to deal with. And the thanks to you guys, this is getting more complicated here. What we're basically saying, okay, let's take a, let's go back to Manuel's points, and this helps me sort of clear my head up. So, basically what I'm understanding from, from Felix is that we're gonna need less college professors. One college professor can teach online, i.e. MIT post their classes. Mm -hmm. Somewhere along the line, you get to a point where you can start reducing your actual staff and say, you know, go to this or go to that. And if you have a question, you go to a TA instead of the professor or the professor shows up once in a while instead of being there lecturing all the time. And it's just, it's recorded and it's available online. So Mike, I guess what I'm asking in a circular way is, are we building a system where in the near future, we really don't need that many professors? Not only in professors, but in everything else we're doing. And that's exactly what that book or the, the talk on, you know, ro robots, it's not just robots, it's this information that you may not even need a professor because you just open the computer, ask him, and it's going to give you all the answers you're looking for way more information that any professor could have in, in his head. And, and those are the areas that we have to really think and how are we going to deal with that? And forget about us dealing with it because we're not going to deal with it. Okay, so let me ask you this. I'm thinking uh, Sociology 101. Felix, I'm going to put you on the spot a little bit here. Mm -hmm. I just envisioned this right now. Sociology 101, I'm taking the course through, I don't know, University X. So day one, I have professor in Indonesia. The second lecture, I have a professor in uh, South America. Third day, I have a professor at Harvard. Fourth day, I have a professor in San Bernardino. Fifth day. So I could have many professors to go through this one course. So I don't need to be one to one, one professor, we meet, I don't know, 10 weeks, 14 weeks, whatever it is, and then take a final. 
-hmm. or final goes to you know professor in the Philippines and they check it for you know uh, pennies to the dollar I don't know is this possible oh yeah uh, so while you asked me I googled it you can take that course on edX and it'll cost you fifty dollars it means four to six hours per week for six weeks it becomes a, comes with a verified certificate what you'll learn sociological perspectives that critically assess commonly held assumptions global perspectives on cultural diversity and interconnected inequalities including race gender sexual orientation age class instructions with local national and international arena oh my god it is dr joanna i don't know how to pronounce her last name haji constandi she's an associate professor of sociology from the university of texas um and yeah you can enroll now if you want to so just Whoa. it's there it's there uh they may not have you know the different perspectives of the different professors because i i think the way the model is is the professor that teaches this course probably gets paid just you know the same way it's just a different a different model you know, i know at the rate at the the professors in, in texas do not make the same amount as they do in california i no, venture to yeah, say they course. probably make a lot less of course so all we do, need to do is find the spot where the real estate is low with good internet and <laughs> we'll do better. Right? Woo! So that's just one, that's edX. I know you can do Coursera, you can do MITx, you know, there, there's all these online massive courses that are available. I was at LinkedIn, remember a couple of weeks ago when we talked uh, in Santa Barbara and you know, lynda.com is, is producing content at a high quality level, you know, Hollywood style level with um, experts in instructional design uh, to help, you know, with the, the, the theory and the pedagogy. And they hire experts to do the classes, it's not actors. And that professor can come in with a full production studio behind them to support them to create their class. And then they get paid per, per view, right? It's a little different, different model. model. That's the one that was doing a lot of the photography st classes. Yeah, but they produced over 2000 videos last year. So it's, it's on any topic you want, you know, wow. they, they've, they've done their, they've taken it to a whole nother level. And with the merger with LinkedIn and, and lynda.com, what's coming is uh, a skills gap analysis of what a student or anybody, anybody that's seeking employment, maybe they this is their existing skill set, and this is the job they're looking for. This gap in between can be filled by a video that you watch on their library, right? So say it's data visualization. Okay, I can go take a class on data visualization from them, from an expert who knows their topic. It's been produced. There's supplemental work. I, I can do all that now. I don't need to take a, a class. I can learn that topic, you know? So it's when maybe society starts valuing the skill sets and the knowledge over the credentials, you know, if, if and when that comes is when that change is going to start even happening faster, I think. Yeah. Wow. So I asked the question again. So are we reducing the number of professors that we're going to need if their information is being downloaded, all this, you know, being edited in and people have choices? Over the next 10, 20 years, the number of professors we need will diminish. I, I think that's the model that, that's coming, you know, um, it, it's economically sustainable as opposed to the, right? I mean, I think that's bottom line, you know, when, when I look at education in the state of California and, and you tell me, you know, from, from the early 60s when it was a good idea to educate all of everybody in California, right, for free, free education, and where we're at now is a whole different, different place. Yeah, I mean, the master plan for education for California has a whole different look to it now. Um, the, the systems are still there, but they're not completely state funded. They're state supplemented, you know, so and I don't see that changing with uh, just how politics is involved with with educational funding and, and coming from the future. You know, I'm going to argue the point that if everything was funded correctly, you know, the 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 way everything was written. We continue to fund it. Everything was put in place. It doesn't matter. This puts a lot of people prepared to do nothing. Oh yeah, that's exactly the area that we've got to take a look at, and we've got to prepare for. 
How? Right. That's <laughs> that's a tough question. I mean, I'm just throwing it out there. Yeah. You know, it's just, <laughs> you know, is what are we going to teach these kids to do? It's not just what they're going to do through a job, but it's how they're going to keep busy. That's the, the, the question that seems to be growing more and more in my mind because we know we're headed down just economics. Much more efficient in technology and everything else and make more money, but it means that people are going to be discarded. But then we have to come up with something to do with them other, otherwise, we're going to have chaos uh, as they started back when the Romans were, were you know, putting col the Colosseum to keep everybody busy. Yeah, we were talking about this earlier, Manuel. I was saying that I think, you know, what's happening in our, you know, lower socioeconomic neighborhoods is, is a microcosm of what's going to possibly happen with the rest of society. You know, for those that lack access to capital and lack, lack access to education, um, it ends up being, like you said, chaos, or for lack of a better word, you know, or anarchy even. Yeah. Uh, and it's about survival. And I think that just expands to a, a greater level, you know. You guys are scaring me. I'm going to have trouble sleeping tonight. I know that. Somewhere I read that you know, we think we, we compartmentalize people and we think that people in lower economic social levels are going to be the first impacted by computers. Let's say for the for robots. Let's for the moment say it's true. Okay. But Felix has been pointing out that these are white collar jobs, i.e. college professors, yeah. where all of a sudden their jobs are threatened or their jobs are eliminated talked about the medical field where surgery is doing doctors and Emmanuel you said you know some of the areas for example maybe computing into accounting is now being given over to software and so they're being less so I want to go back to a, an article I read many many years ago it's stuck in my head that a lot of the people who are leaders in gangs are actually quite brilliant people mm -hmm. it's just no education but they really understand how to put together a massive organization. Forget their credentials to school. Maybe they have none. Now, you take white collar people and you disemploy them. And you don't give them future opportunities. Very brilliant people doing nothing. What do we see there? Are we going to see more gangs? I don't know. I mean, white collar gangs? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but again, more hackers more hackers we call it you know we refer to them as gang as you you're indicating but it's going to be that type of mentality and that type of organizations that are going to start to develop if we don't start to pay attention now and start to attack that type of environment with the thinking that we're now doing and have everybody start thinking into that direction of what's going to be needed to resolve it. I mean, you know, one of the things that I'm looking forward to is to see this movie that the Pope has come out, answering a lot of questions that relate to a lot of the problems that we're going to be facing, because it's the same thing that we're starting to face now. at just very low level. So we're going to have to see, because it's going to, go into areas that, that we don't even, you know, we really think of taboo, if you want to call them, in any relation to work. But it's actually the relationships that we have between humanity. And we keep on saying that these computers start to create silos within us. But as this starts to evolve, it's going to create problems as we start to relate to the rest of us and how we're going to, as our depression starts to increase and we try to solve that depression through and it's going to be a lot of fighting and, and uh, overcoming and, and, you know, 
surviving. You know, Armando, it was that conversation we had previously about wicked problems, right? And solving solving the unsolvable, right? And, and tackling those problems. And I think that's what we need to be able to uh, empower and, and, and prepare our students for the future, right? It's, 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 a, it's a matter of survival is how to be able to learn and deal and cope and, and still interact, uh, cre recreate humanity, but towards solving those problems that haven't been, in, been invented yet. I'll go back there. You know, yeah. we talked about the problems that are coming that, that we're creating now that we don't even know yeah. um, because, you know, right now we're dealing with the problems of that, in, that first industrial revolution and what's going on with nature and, and the impacts. And I mean, you remember Los Angeles where you couldn't breathe, you know, yeah. and, and, and drive around and, and changes in, um, in how we, what we use for fuel and the regulations have, have changed that in some senses, but yet that's one city, a big city in the United States, but the rest of the world still has major impact in there. And so, you know, those are problems, like I said, we're going back to things that, that haven't been uncovered yet that we have to solve. I'll remind you, Armando, I talked about that, that, uh, and Manuel, we talked about that polar ice caps melting and, getting to a point where they're releasing, you know, uh, bacteria that hasn't been in the world for millions of years or hundreds of millions of years that could kill us all off, you know? So that's what we need to task the people, you know, Correct. who might not have a job at, you know, how do we solve for these kinds of things or how do we prepare for, you know, what's what's coming there? And it's a matter of, like you said, making a shift, a paradigm shift in, in how we teach and learn and, and what problems we're trying to solve. The word that's going to stick to me in today's presentation, one of them, is the paradigm shift. Yeah. I hadn't thought of it, the word, until you mentioned it. We cannot sustain a status quo mindset mm -hmm. that tomorrow will be a duplication of today. Correct. We've got to just let go of it and just totally come up with something brand new. Here we are using this technology, which was not available to us a few years ago. You know, where we can talk, we can put together 20 people around the world and have a conversation all together. This is brand new. But we can use it to be proactive with it, to bring the issue to the table and, and discuss solutions and, you know, and, and come up to a, a higher level where we say, okay, I'm going to go back as a leader to my community and says, hey, here's the options. And I have both of you to thank for that. And also Kurt Hahn, unfortunately, couldn't join us. But, you know, I, I, I can see where we need to evolve. Yep. And, and the good thing I think, or, or a positive note to end on is that, you know, <laughs> I think we're, we're a resilient, you know, species, right? You know, we've, uh, we've managed I don't to, know. I don't know. I, I ask the dinosaurs that question <laughs> after they live millions of years. I yeah. don't know that, man, Felix. I'm not sure I'm willing to go with you on that one. Who knows? Who knows? <laughs> no, but I, mean, I, I do agree with the fact that we are resilient and, and, and those are the things that we're discussing now to make sure that we make everybody aware or as many people that are willing to listen, I should say, because it is going to be a challenge, but it's the only way we're going to survive. Yeah. I'm going to throw a monkey wrench into it. I got a few seconds. Let me throw a monkey wrench in there. We're evolving so fast, so furiously. Quantum computers, we didn't even touch those. We're learning sciences of something we can open Pandora's box and create something so horrible, uh, a nanotechnology area where we infect it with something and we let it go and all of a sudden we wipe out every human. The only thing around is robots working on their own time. Um, we're entering a world where our potential is huge, but our knowledge of how to use it is not catching up to us yet. So we do have the way of disseminating, I mean, uh, of destroying ourselves. We, we got past the nuclear part, but now we got into the virus part, you know, and then we just barely touched on that. Manuel, you said something about humanity. We need to learn how to be humans again. We're sort of losing touch on that. And it sort of ties in with that question that if we have the power to do harm to millions of people, somebody says, wait a minute, you know, we're, we're going too far using this all this new systems and we can do some real horrible things i i'm i'm in it all i i don't know where i'm going with this i i i i've learned so much from you guys 
and and now I have to think. So, there's so much to think about. We need to take this, think about it a lot, and then come back and revisit, and come up with some solutions that we can throw out. Whether anybody's going to listen, that's a whole different question. But you know, we have to discuss it, and then create the solutions to present to those that are developing the plans, the study plans, and teaching our our youth. Yeah, and I'd love to hear from a youth perspective, you know, because when I've had these conversations in the, in, in the classroom, you know, um, I get a lot of blank stares where it's just over their head, you know, because they've never even thought about some of these things. So. I love to, to have some real frank and honest conversations about what happens when the career you're preparing for goes away, you know, and, and see, I, I mean, the same goes for us. Right. I mean, but I think it, it's not going to impact us the same way as it does them in the future, you know, so I actively make these thoughts and choices uh, with the education of my son, you know, he's, he's four, we're getting ready on the verge to put him into school and, it's, it's a school system that's designed to teach him, teach him how to go to a world of work, right? It's exactly. so do, do I do that? Do I follow the same or do I flip it and, you know, prepare him from home, still socialize him where we can with other kids, but prepare him for a world that that is not existent yet, you know, knowing what I know, you know, so that's, that's a, a constant daily battle that, that we go through, you know. I go back to Manuel, Manuel, what he said. I said, Word, we're, will anyone listen? You know, we're making the best effort we can to help your kids, you know, Felix, your grandkids, your familia kids that in the familia, Manuel, you know, you're a grandfather as well. Yep. And I'm not yet, but, you know, I deal with a lot of familia. Mm -hmm. We're trying to get them to understand that, status quo will not work anymore jump out of that you know rattle whatever it takes to get them out of it and says you know and this is not something that someday i think we started that conversation uh, 1984 is 2018 it's not 1984 and it's right in our faces yeah i re i truly hope i want to thank both of you for being on the program and i really and I, I invite our viewers to send us their perspective to participate in the discussions that we're going to have. Uh, we're going into another book. Again, today's book was, you know, um, Martin Ford, Rise of the Robot. Uh, there's another one is Race Against the Machine. Mm -hmm. We're going to do that also, and I hope to have you guys back. But the idea is, uh, I think this is a show of the forefront of the future. And I think we, we're trying to put an alarm out here really loud to people and says, you know, this, we've never been here before, but that doesn't mean that we're, we're not, it's not that far away. It mm -hmm. has to be thought of today. So as we're getting close to close the show, let, let me please uh, have you guys do your closing statements. I'll start off. Um, you know, I just, I just think, I think society has helped prepare us fortunately and unfortunately for what we're going to be dealing with. And, and when I say resilient, that's what I was talking about. You know, all of the inequity and discrimination and, and things that, that our peoples have faced, you know, day in and day out, prepare us to be a resilient group, I think. And I think we're, we're, we'll be ready to bounce and, and, you know, I think we come from a, a working people <laughs> that find a way to make it work. You know, and so that that leaves me hope that that it's just a matter of how do we uh, prepare the next group to think about that. You know, I'd love to bring in experts um, that study familialismo, you know, and seeing how that's changed with with the new generation, right, um, and socialization within the American society. I, I'd love to explore that topic. I think that'd be really cool to to see. Um, but uh, you know, it's not going to happen overnight. I've said that in the past but it's gonna come real quickly. And just like in real estate, there's ups and downs markets and there's ways to, to make money in those kinds of markets. 
you know, that's what capitalism has given us, right? A way to 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 make money and and be able to thrive. It may not be for everyone. We might not be able to do that for everyone, you know. And I'm not sure how how we handle that as a society. Society, but you know, it's definitely something to to think about and prepare. Uh, how do we prepare our, our kids and our students for the future? You know, I take a look and, and see, taking a look at my granddaughter and all the other very young children and see that they're much more capable than probably we were when we were, you know, coming up. And then we also, I also take a look at the students that are at, at Bosco and seeing that they're extremely resilient in being able to, to tackle a lot of issues that are way beyond what we were tackling. The environment is totally different. So I have a lot of hope that if we pay attention to each one of these areas, we make everybody aware as much as they're willing to listen. And then we start to see changes that are going to be changed, that are going to happen because they have to happen. So as long as we stay in the forefront and keep this up, I think the challenge is going to be there, but it's going to be easier and easier. And again, a tremendous faith in God to make sure that they give us the strength to be able to accomplish all this. My closing statements is a lot of it is thanks to you, both of you. Um, yes, there is hope. Let's, you know, this is not where, oh my God, it's all downhill you know, shut everything down and just, just sit around and do nothing. There is hope. Um, what I hadn't really conceptualized until I'm hearing both of you talk is that I think we're realizing that we have all this brain power. We talk about computer power, we talk about robotic power, but we have this human potential to put it together. Uh, Felix is in a university. You have all access to all these great kids that obviously are thinkers. Manuel, you, you have access to the Salesian neighborhood, whether it be local or globally. You have these wonderful kids. We have access to the next generation and also through computers to be able to start dialoguing, getting them involved, and, and, and having all this mega mental power start work churning itself out to resolve these issues. And they're so busy right now trying to get into the dynamics of their job and where they are and all that. So we are bringing in our experiences and saying, look, we've got this one issue. We want you to look at it. We want you to stay on it because your life depends on it, i.e. there may be no work in the near future. So how are you going to mitigate the future for that? One last thought for me was, you Please. know, I was, I was thinking about a quote from Edward Deming that says, every system is perfectly designed to get the results it gets, right? Okay. Right. So it brings back that that talk of ethics in, in what we're doing. And as we're designing these systems and implementing this technology that, that we keep the ethics in what it is that we're doing and not letting the machine make the decision for you, but using it to make wiser decisions. So So keeping that in our, in our thoughts and minds as we move forward. I agree with you completely. Gentlemen, thank you for the headache. <laughs> now I've got a lot to think about, and I hope our viewers as well. We did not necessarily look for a solution. We, we started with asking the right questions, and there are more questions we need to evolve. And again, I recommend reading the book, you know, absolutely to start here, and other books that we're going to highlight and go over. This is, again, part of the series of the fourth industrial revolution in our doorstep. Um, take it very seriously as the viewers. And I want to thank two leaders uh, who come in from two very different perspectives. They never actually ever met themselves. But, you know, they, how, how similar we have this concern that we do have an issue. It must be looked at. It must be resolved. It isn't something of fancy, a fancy, fancy passing item. It's something that deeply is going to affect all of us. It already is, and we're not even aware of it. I want to thank you again, gentlemen, for being on the program, and I look forward to doing this again in the near future as well to continue to the next phase, to the next book. 
Ladies and gentlemen, I'm Armando F. Sanchez. I am the CEO of Armando F. Sanchez Production. You can contact me at afsanchez66 at gmail.com. I look forward to hearing you. And I look forward to having these two wonderful gentlemen, Kurt Hahn and other uh, leaders in the community anywhere in the world to participate in our discussion. Thank you. And thank Thanks you sir. and good evening. Adios, Felix. Adios, Manuel. Good night and thank you. <laughs>